Spartans to the latest podcast evolved book club. Yay! <laughs> we read a book. What? I like books too. I am your host, Krista, and with me today is Aaron. Hi, guys. And David. Hello, everybody. And we are talking about Halo Oblivion, not the video game, the book, the Halo not book. Not that bad movie. Not that bad movie either, no. Uh, and it's by Troy Denning, friend Woo! of the show. Hi, Troy. <laughs> Before we get started, I have some amazing patrons to acknowledge because they are very nice to us and help us keep the show running and keep the lights on, so to say. All right, we have Alex, Colin, Dezudo, Edgar, Evan, Gonk, Lance, Matt, Matthew, Matthew, Mohammed, Noah, Philip, Ryan, Rye, Spencer, and Zach. Thank you all. You guys are the MP- MVPs of the show. So now we have to talk about and book and what this book is, huh? Who wants to read the information on the book, Aaron? I suppose I could. <laughs> this will be the only thing I've read of this book because I listened to everything else and cheated. <laughs> How dare you? That's what we need you. We need you to give that audio review because we're not. Well, at least I know the pronunciations then. So at least That's I bring true. that to the table. All right. We will go through this. Like we said, this is Halo Oblivion, a Master Chief story, because it's very important that you have that Master Chief story part in. <laughs> we didn't get enough from the cover. Yes, the close-up on Master Chief's helmet with his gun, just a hint that it's Chief, we might not have known. This book's about Chief? What? I know. Did you know some of it takes place in his head, from his what? perspective? Like all the- What? <laughs> just like the video game. I know. As we said, this book was written by Troy Denning. It is published by, published by Simon & Schuster. It is currently available in real book and audio form and- Ebook, I believe. That's ah, a different book we were talking about that's not an ebook. I got yeah. confused there. Yes, yes, yes. It's hard to keep track of who's who's what form. Well, they also put out two Halo books like two weeks from each other, so it's getting a little confusing. No, I, I'm not a fan of these books close together. Do they not know how slowly yeah. we read? We need more time. Warren's so far behind, it's unreal. <laughs> he hasn't read Silent Storm yet. <laughs> <laughs> the poor guy's just struggling along, trying to like keep life going. This book was published on the 24th of September 2019. It is 400 pages long. And we have a synopsis. Would you like me to read the synopsis? You can read the synopsis. We want to hear your voice. Oh, Jesus. People don't want to hear my voice. They only think they do. All right. 2526. It has been more than a year since humanity first encountered the hostile military alliance of alien races known as the Covenant and several weeks after the United Nations Space Command's devastating counterattack in Operation Silent Storm was deemed an overwhelming success. The UNSC has put its faith in the hands of Spartans, led by the legendary Master Chief John 117, enhanced super soldiers raised and trained from childhood via a clandestine black ops project to be living weapons. But the Covenant, enraged and fearful of their enemies' unexpected strategies and prowess, is now taking its recent def- or is not taking its recent defeat lightly and is now fully determined to eradicate humanity from existence brutally overrunning the ill-fated planets of the outer colonies faster uh, than retreats can be ordered if the UNSC has any chance of stemming the tide of war the master chief and blue team must drop onto an empty hellish world in order to capture a disabled covenant frigate filled with valuable technology It has all the makings of a trap, but the bait is far too tempting to ignore, and the tantalising prize is being offered by a disgraced and vengeful Covenant fleet master, whose sole opportunity for redemption lies in extinguishing humanity's only true hope of survival. Well, how nice! What, What a nice synopsis. Thank you, Aaron. The timeline is June 5th to June 12th, 2526. Nice and early. Very early on, yeah, very early. So we're going to go right into like spoilers and kind of talking about it, but overall impressions of the book, David. I liked it. Um, I think I liked Silent Storm more. I agree with that. Just the premise and the setup is a little bit different. And this, it feels like a direct sequel. So like, obviously that comes with the, that's obvious. It mentions, Uh, it mentions Operation Silent Storm like all the time. (laughs) Yeah. And we go back to, it's got 
continues on the same characters and we have like obviously even in the covenant the same characters are, are brought back and you're even in around the same planet i was familiar but i couldn't quite remember why so i kind of started looking they obviously they tell you but i kind of forgot to start the nether drop the planet where like a lot of the where they actually go on the surface of it this time as opposed to the it was the start of the first book where they were trying to capture a ship over this planet mm, okay so you actually get to go down to the surface now I don't know, I, I liked it. Um, I liked that it was all in pretty much one location. I do appreciate that because, you know, what Halo books tend to jump around all over the place. So I think we even talked to Troy about this. Uh, I appreciate that, like, the scope is a bit smaller in terms of the locations that we go. I mean, pretty much we have Mercer, the planet at the start, High Charity, and then Nether Drop, and that's kind of it. I like that. I thought that was cool. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of the castaways uh, or the oh, cast offs. Oh, really? The cast offs. I thought they were some of the more interesting parts of the book. They prompted some interesting discussions and de- and definitely set John up against his uh, against Unity and against Oni when they were like discussing of what to do about them and stuff like that. So I I did like, obviously it shows John's or the Spartan Two's kind of morality. They had some interesting discussions. I I don't know what it was about it. Is it because they're kids? I think so. Some of it is just a little tad bit, tad little bit. Kind of naggy. Just a, yeah, and kind of slightly unbelievable. And I thought it was interesting to kind of learn more about you know pirates and how people were just like, you know what, we're just gonna put you on a planet and leave. Bye. And they survived for like six generations on this. Because let, let's let's just say that Netherop is not a nice place to live. To be fair, I think they were six very short generations, so that's not necessarily an achievement. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact that they did stay and managed to reproduce and stuff, I suppose, is impressive. And Well, one of the characters said she had six children. Like, only two of them survived, but it was like, wh- what? And they were putting her in her 20s. Yeah. Bunch of teens on a planet, left to their own devices. Why, does Halo- why, are-, why are so many Halo books about teenagers now? Because all of the adults have children that are teenagers now. Oh. Stop reproducing. <laughs> Gotta get all those new generations in for Halo Infinite, Krista. Gotta make new fans. It's true, we must corrupt them all. Mm. Halo will once again be the most popular video game. This is true. I, li- I like this book. I think I kind of agree with David. I think it's. I think I probably liked Silent Storm more. But I don't dislike this book. I like the things it does, although there's something I'm just not entirely... I don't know if I'm sold on it, but I can't quite put my finger on it. I don't mind the castaways. I like this slightly weird little collection of humans left on this planet, but maybe it's just the fact we don't get to explore anything. It never stops. That might just be what it is. I I wouldn't mind a little time to explore how these people survived on this planet, what their life was like before, things like that, whereas it's just non-stop. It's just constant motion. The operation pretty much takes place over a course of a few hours. Yeah, Yeah. like it's one day, they never even hit the night cycle, and I think his armor at one point says it's like 23 hours of daylight. Pretty much, yeah. They're pretty much just there for the day and gone again. But I like a lot of the other things. Well, and speaking on, like, how fast this book goes, there's actually, like, it's revealed that pretty early on that Netherup had an ancient civilization living on it. Yeah, an unknown civilization, so it's not Forerunner. No, it's not, because they weren't, it's, they weren't techno, they were technologically savvy enough to build roads and stuff, but it looks like they never got off the planet. One of the things that they said about it is that, um... They believe, or like the human kind of researchers believe that global warming, essentially of the planet heating up so fast, essentially killed off this race. And they believe that's what caused it. I thought that was cool. I thought it was really interesting. I wish it was a little more looked into, like maybe if they found more ruins or something like that. The, um, they did, we didn't get to go to it, but um, the cast-offs were living in an underground city. Oh, yeah. And then that's where they got their walkers, their weird, their weird spider machines. I feel like that it that was very underutilized. Yeah. I feel like I feel like the cast offs could have been used more and we could have gone to where they live and shit like that and seen the spider machines a little more. It is it was very downplayed that like an entire civilization lived and died on this planet and they left behind enough technology that these kids were using it. They had microwave beams and stuff. Yeah, they sent a cool 
kind of a different kind of weapon. I thought it was very interesting how it like shut down Spartan armor and stuff. It was like an EMP kind of. So Netherup is a kind of interesting place, but um, let's talk. Do we want to talk about the fleet master Nizat, the big villain of the series? Because he had a pretty interesting intro. Do we want to talk about the little opener on Metro? Oh first? yeah, we can talk about that really quick. Because I quite like that battle. I did. I thought that was great. This book really highlights that like humanity can't get into the minds of the Covenant and the Covenant can't get into the minds of humanity. There's like a very different path of logic. It's like the first or second. It's just like, well, it's 25, 26. Yeah. So it's about this, the first year of the war. And like, it's very interesting just like of how little knowledge each side has about the other and how desperate humanity are for like artifacts and like reclaimed technology, which is the whole premise really of the book is a ship is crashed and we're going to try and get it and it's obvious to trap and blah 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 but it is really interesting to see um that side of it of like both sides not understanding each other and struggling to do so and obviously they do an awesome job of setting up spartans as being incredible even in the eyes of the elites and hear them talking about them and referring to them and constantly actually being actively afraid of them and with the knowledge that, like, if the Spartans are on the field, your plan is going to shit because they can do whatever they want. They will appear whenever they want, disappear whenever they want. There's a great line in there about, like, how they will appear as they please and they'll destroy you before you even know you're in a fight. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Do you know what I mean? They do, <laughs> even within a year, let's say, of the war that they have, the, the Spartans are that respected. And they're not referring to them as demons yet, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. I can't remember even if they referred to them to them as that in the first book oh i can't remember yeah they never said it anywhere here yeah mersa was a weird intro you kind of get the uh well you're introduced to a couple characters and we're not really going to mention them by name because they're not really relevant to the story at all it just kind of is um it's just a battle going on with it's like xeno time or something like that this resource it's essentially something they're mining and I think the Covenant use it in their weapons or something. I can't remember what I it. think humanity use it for, I think he said they use it for lasers and small fusion reactors. So it's like ships and weapons and the Covenant want it because yeah, they've said this is the only planet lately that they haven't immediately glassed. So they're like, they must want the elements. So we have to do acid denial. So they're going from like, my, humans are going from mine to mine. Nuking them and collapsing them and stuff. And then this is the last main left. It sets it up straight away of like UNSC versus colonials because this isn't in in inner colony. So very much so like Chief and his teams are like not well respected. And it shows a very different military structure of these colonials and like how they deal with things. And like obviously the negatives of that. And Chief has great interactions here with the leader. Um, the fe- The female leader, I think they're like a, they're like a ghost kind of squad that they call ghosts or something ghost fifth ghost battalion sorry that's what they're, they're the militia of mercer yeah they're like the local militia what do they call her her name her second name is like unpronounceable but her first name is like pa or something Bayid de gaia y eliza dulles karen oh my goodness and she has like a smaller abbreviation i can't remember what it is but that was i think it's get. like pa is it pa or pa, pa. something yeah. like that yeah i thought that was very interesting and I, I loved how even at Chief's age it shows the Spartans like their knowledge of not only like warfare but like of people and of soldiers of like the toll things take and how long you can stay asleep and how long you can do this and do that and how he's factoring in all these things into their decision making uh, I thought that was awesome in terms of that of like obviously what Blue Team has to overcome in terms of dealing with these guys who are not behaving as expected It kind of goes into how blue team can keep functioning too, even on even when they're like on the battlefield for a long time. Kind of goes over like the stim packs and all these different resources they use to keep fighting. And I love that blue team came to battle with six gauze turrets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like Amazing. that was their or that was their immediate thing. Was like, oh, we've ripped these gauss turrets off warthogs on the way here. We brought you guys some guns, but we're gonna take the turrets. And they're like, how are you going to move from point to point with the turrets? And they're all just like. We'll manage. Yeah. <laughs> we run. We'll take them. We'll be okay. Don't worry about it. And they, like they do, which is the, the cool part. And I love that how they figure out, I think they figure out fairly quickly, like, 
we don't really have to worry about air attacks because if the Covenant had air support, the Covenant wouldn't be driving up the road because they're taking like this. They have this artillery convoy and bridging vehicles and... That thing sounded cool, the bridging vehicle, how they're going to bridge the canyon. I assume it was a mechanical bridge and not like a hard light. No, I got the imp- I got the impression it was shooting something across and then they were pulling something physical across with them to create a bridge. Yeah, it, it was awesome. That fight and how they encountered and even the drones where they went from facing a few to the shock of having thousands on the field. That sounded awesome. Like, and they referred to it as like air cav and he was like telling the guys at the mines, like prepare for incoming air cavalry. And they're like, there's no air support coming in. And he's like, no, there's like a thousand drones coming towards you. And your man's like, what the fuck? We've only ever seen like 10 before or some shit. And I like the sudden mention of the anti-gravity belts that the drones have. Oh, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, I never even considered that. That they weren't just naturally flying. It was for them... Well, also, the MRSA had a higher gravity than what they were used to as well, so it was a compensation. It sounds like it just helps them to move a little faster and a little quicker, but still, I never think of the drones as, I suppose I should think of them as our cavalry, but you always hit them in swarms, but in the game you never think of them as much of a challenge, but I suppose if you're a soldier and a thousand drones with plasma rifles appear, you're in trouble. So so basically, MRSA, the plan fails... Blue team are taken out, and then pretty much all the locals die. <laughs> I mean, is there anything else we really want to talk about on the pl- on this uh, kind of intro part? I don't think overly. Oh, I think the only thing to take away from it is Chief learns a valuable lesson and not letting people have their say. Yeah. Well, he did. He he compromised is what he, he did. He compromised, and then the whole plan goes tits up because of it, and he suddenly realizes, no, if this happens again, people don't get their say because compromises. Even though it kept everyone happy, it cost them. Yeah, I, I mean, it killed everyone, pretty much. They were pretty much prepared to do that anyway. It, well, it, was, well, it was the fact that they got the mine and they weren't, they didn't get a chance to, like, pre- asset denial the mine, essentially, because of the squad pretty much going for suicide anyway and not blowing the bridge like they were supposed to and stopping the rates. And also, Cole pulls them out anyway, so I don't think even if things had been going well, they never would have succeeded. And they got pulled out because of Lucky Break, right? Yeah. Yes. We jump to the Fleet Master before we Lucky Break, do we? Y- yeah. I mean, he. It's kind of go. It goes back and forth, but we can kind of describe what the what the setup is for the Lucky Break. So Nizat was in the first book, right? I think so. I'm gonna double check now. He is the Fleet Master at the end when the uh, I forget the Silent Shadow character decapitates the Prophet. Oh yeah, yeah, he's he's on the ship. What was the prophet's name? It was something stupid. Uh, he was like the minor minister of something Geographic or other. Geographic something something. Yeah, uh, yeah, he was. He was the he was the fleet master of the fleet of ex- exonerable obedience. And they were the ones that got their asses handed to them in silent storm. Yeah, exactly. So he has like a huge vendetta, vendetta not against Spartans, but against. <laughs> When they first said when they first said that, I'm like, what are what did they mean? It's like O N E E E E or whatever. It was it was spelled really weird, but it was like Oh, they just pronounced it Oni in the in the audiobook. I didn't get that. Oh yeah, they oh, wrote it weird the s- in the book. The spelling is different, yeah. Oh. Okay. You don't get that at all in the audiobook. They just say Oni. You could see that they were like trying to emphasize that they don't understand the word, that it's an acronym. Yeah. But right. It's cool. I hope it's an acronym and I didn't just mess that up. But um. Office of Naval Intelligence. Yeah, he's been summoned to high charity for basically arbiter treatment, except apparently the the way to discipline uh, failing captains and fleet masters in the Covenant is they send you back to your ship, tell you to be reassigned, and then the Silent Shadow come out and decapitate you. I love the Silent Shadow. They're just kind of clean up crew. It's a crazy, like, I'm not gonna, I was going to say mechanic, but it's a crazy idea that, like, that's how the f- this fleet operates. That uh, And I know it kind of makes sense because of what the Prophets are doing in terms of lying to the Sangheili. So to keep them in line, they have this hit squad, pretty much, to, like, almost self-police themselves in case any radicals appear and go against them. But obviously, I was actually quite shocked with, like, this whole scene of, like, what he actually does. 
Like, I did not anticipate that the premise is that it's actually a rebel fleet that uh, sets the trap. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that at all. And then I thought that the other, let's say the real Covenant would have more of an impact on it than just like the the hit squad that they sent out to the planet. And obviously there's a planet side, there's a space battle happening the whole time that we only really get hints of, of the two fleets kind of fighting and the rebel fleet just being on the planet trying to set up the plan, I guess, or set up the trap. But I wasn't, I wasn't anticipating the whole scene, um, where he just kind of lies his way in and then just kind of starts murdering guards. Yeah, I was like, Phew. yeah. So I, I liked the appearances of all three prophets here because I just like seeing them. They're interesting characters. Yeah. So the conversation between them were really interesting, and that's when Nizat is like, "All right, here's my plan. Oni are the people pretty much calling the shots." For the humans, so if we find where they live, we can go murder them. And the prophets are like, interesting. It's such a simplistic plan. Yeah, he's yeah. like, yes, they will take the technology back to their innovation temple, and you're like, oh, you're so <laughs> fucked. <laughs> You've no clue how this is gonna work. I like those little uh, tracking forerunner tracking devices they have. They're quite the luminary cool. beacons. The luminary beacons, yeah. I like the idea that that's how they were going to find or they were going to know when the Great Journey began is you would have a beacon on your ship and you would activate it and everyone in High Charity would know. Yeah, that they're activating the halos. Or they, no, just that you had found them. It was, the, yeah, you it had found the halo. Found oh, it was, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was when they were supposed to find them, which would make sense. I assume then High Charity would come to you because... Yeah, yeah, I imagine so. You have these. Also, I really want to know what happened to the lost beacon. Yeah, that's it. Did sound you can't tease isn't me it? like that. Except they know where it is, which is the really fun part. Real quick, the beacons are basically like they're for they're just forerunner beacons that like a receiver will get a location when a uh, beacon is active. But it, but unlike you know primitive radio technology, this is like an instantaneous uh, blip that they get. It's quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement. It's the same setup as. I know someone in the Discord that would like the mention of this. They do it in Mass Effect. Oh. That's the that's the like get out for why you can communicate to people. They have certain But even in Mass Effect is rare. states. Yeah, it's between certain points though, so it's between a device and a receiver and that's it. You can't like call multiple people. Yeah. I think it's the flotilla of unsung piety. I think that's the one that goes missing. So, like, they know where that beacon is, but they can't get it because it's in the center of the galaxy. Yeah, oh yeah. Cool. Which is cool. I just like the idea of this Covenant fleet that got lost in slip space. And they were looking for, like, they were looking for foreigner objects, too. They were right? on the hunt for halos, yeah. It's uh, any Covenant fleet that was exploring a new area of the galaxy was given a beacon and sent out. And then if they found a halo, they would activate the beacon and I assume summon High Charity to come to them. Which we know didn't happen because during the video games, it's not really a player. So we know the Luminary Beacons probably don't make it to 2552. I am probably, yeah. But it it makes sense that maybe, because we know how they found certain planets in terms of the major, like how they found Earth and how they found Reach. But obviously by the end of the book, the Beacons are still in play. Yes. It seems like both of them are. Yeah, we're down to two out of four. It was a Kelly. No, Linda picked up one. Yeah, they take the power supply back with them. Yeah, they take the shield, the but the corpse of this uh, heavy elite, essentially. So I imagine that something comes of that, uh, both positive in terms of, all right, they have covenant the, the technology that they can try and work back on. But I don't know, maybe Halsey finds it and doesn't tell anybody. Maybe there's something hidden there, which I think could be interesting. But I think Kelly's one is the one that's probably in the wind. Or sorry, not Kelly Linda's one, that um the location device that she picks up and just kind of keeps it. They, they don't mention it ever again, so I imagine she carries it with her wherever she goes next. They're the last two beacons left because we find out then that one was destroyed in Silent Storm, so there only are two left. And yes. the Covenant lose this ability forever. That also makes perfect sense then. As to why they've never been mentioned again and why they no longer have this ability. The Rebel, essentially, I can't remember his name, he begins with a W, it's really long, saying he, he oh, had... Yeah, yeah. He had of the two Rebel fleets, uh, two Rebel ships alive now. He has a, and he's and he like uh, Nizat calls him a coward and says he's just going to go off after this battle and probably 
hope that the beacons did something and hopefully pick up my mantle after I... Because at, at some point in the book, Nazat's just like, I'm going to die here. Like, there's yeah. no way. I just need to get these beacons to the humans. And something I think is so hilarious is Nazat's like so intent on like basically handing over these beacons to them that the humans are just like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. And they're like, maybe they got something from us. Maybe we need to go hunt them down. This entire book can be summed up by the Covenant aren't doing what we think they should be doing. And like, that's the entire story is. And the humans aren't doing what the Covenant think they should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the Covenant are confused because then they're like, they're dealing with castaway humans. They're dealing with the Spartans and the Marines. And then they're dealing with the engineers of the salvage ship who like bring their own stuff to the game. I love that. They, they did such a great job, uh, essentially, of like making life difficult. Yeah. Do we wanna do we wanna talk about how this kicks off then? Yes. Yeah, After go ahead. Because right, if bear with me in case I forget anything here because I've only just listened to it. So they have their like briefing with Cole where he basically I think there's a message sent to them that Halsey says on it, This is a trap, but you've gotta go and do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yep. it's a great message. We we're pretty sure this is a trap, but you're gonna go and do it because you're John and you're my Spartans. So the plan is, they have this ship called the Lucky Break. This is what they've named it. Uh, UNSC Wolfpack. I think this is the first time we men- we hear mention of Wolfpacks, which are covenant or human, they're like small fleets of destroyers with like a carrier. And their job is to harass covenant fleets. So they've got this ship called the Lucky, the Lucky Break. They think they've taken out its engines and it's crash landed on this planet Netherop but they don't actually know that it's a trap and that the Covenant have actually set it up. I said the Fleetmaster, I'm just going to call him Cavarossi just for, or Nizat, Nizat, I suppose Nizat's easier. Mm -hmm. He has set this up where this was his like most important ship that he had left. All all he seems to have left now are like the Covenant version of Prowlers. I think they briefly mentioned them in the last game, in the last book. They're not as good as UNSC stealth ships, but they're kind of all he has. So he has this fleet of ships in the system waiting and then the bait has crashed on the planet and the wolf pack is holding position in orbit trying to protect it and the UNSC have sent an only salvage ship to the planet and their goal is to pick up the, is it a corvette? It is, I was just looking at it now. It's a Covenant frigate called Steadfast Strike. That's what Lucky Break actually is. Yeah, it's a frigate. Their goal is to send blue team on, flush out the Covenant, take the ship and then fly it off the planet and take it back to UNSC space so they can study it. But they don't know that Nizad has set this up then as a trap. We call back to Chief who then gets briefed that they don't have ODST support for this mission because they burned through their supply of ODSTs. On Silent Storm. And the few Black Daggers that are left have been reassigned to train new ODSTs so they're kind of uh, short of specialists so they just get regular marines what do they call them blue blue platoon or something they're it's blue team blue what are you talking about chief names the team of him and the marines they give them like a name like blue unit or blue something oh what was what were they called before that i for, I forget what they were blue dagger or something like that what is the what was the stealth sh- the core the the prowler called uh knight Nightwatch. Nightwatch. They arrive in the system, and instead of what they normally do, which is take their time, scan the system, see who's watching for them, they decide that plan B is to launch a pelican as bait and see if anyone tries to shoot it down. So they launch the first pelican, it gets shot down, the crew are sacrificed. There's only, I think, three on board, and Chief's not very happy about it. And then the captain suddenly reveals to them that actually plan B isn't that they're going to launch on one pelican, they're going to take the prowler to the surface because they set up before this that the uh, prowlers are capable of landing on a planet. So uh, Amalea, I think that's how they pronounce it in the audiobook, she is the very ambitious Oni captain. (laughs) Yep. Almost to the point of stupidity. Yeah. yeah, she said, like, I think there's a line in the audiobook where she says, like, the mission comes first, and sometimes even at the expense of her career. And you're like, sometimes? 
sometimes. That, doesn't, yeah, that like, doesn't sound good. Like she spends her whole time here salivating about how she's going to be like the upper echelons of Oni if she can pull this off. She thinks, what does she say? She's like, she thinks she's honing like the, the battle edge of Blue Team and the Spartans and making them the best that they can be. And I'm like, oh, you have no hope. Yep, pretty much. She has this ambitious plan where she will take the Night Watch in and drop the Marines and Blue Team out beside Lucky Break. But, of course, it doesn't go according to plan. And like all good things, her second Pelican gets shot down and then they get shot down. So they crash something like 50 kilometers away from the Lucky Break. And it turns out that this planet is... It may even be worse than the sunny desert planet that Pitch Black takes place on. Yeah, that's actually a good... uh... Because this this planet's awful. It's uh, too hot, too dry. There's not a lot of shade. Uh, It's actually so hot that you can't see into the distance because it's that constant heat shimmer. Yep. They talk about that a lot, too. Mm. I was reading this book and I'm like, oh, is it hot in here? It sounds like anything over half a kilometer, you can't see it. You can just see like that shimmery desert effect all the time. And then it doesn't seem to matter where you are. You're up in a hill a shimmery desert you look down it's worse uh, at one stage chief isn't sure that the shipwreck is moving so he has to have like he keeps checking with kelly to see is the shipwreck moving or is it just like an effect from the haze and that so although the only convenient thing is that blue team are totally fine because they have nice uh climate controlled armor and everyone else around them is like dying of heat stroke yeah and like they, I think they say a couple of times that they do lose Marines to heat stroke here and there, and they lose crewmen to it. They Although do, even yeah. I think there's a couple of times where Chief mentions how his armor's struggling to like bleed they off do. the heat. Yeah, no, they kind of lead it off really well of like the exertions and like the toll that they take even on the Spartans. So like they have one scene has them sprinting for miles, so like it's like a two or three hour sprint. Um, it's in like order yeah, to get to I the think ship. they do like twenty kilometers nonstop. And the thing I thought about that was they talk about how they did their weapons checks and all while sprinting. And I'm just like, that's got to take a certain level of dexterity, ultimate dedication and skill that you can check your weapons and do maintenance checks on them while running at like maybe, I don't know, 20, 25 mile an hour. What's what's (laughs) a Spartan? Like 30 mile an hour, top speed, something like that. They did some calculations. I can't really remember uh, in, in the book. I think it's uh, it's fairly good. I, I love the continued... They've done a really good job in these books of building up how, even without an AI, Spartan armor's rather intelligent. Oh, yeah. I was, like, doing calculations and shit for him. And I like how he, he try At one point, he thinks, I wonder what the odds are of surviving this, and the armor doesn't tell him. It just gives him a countdown to when he's going to crash, and it's just like, that's a bad sign when even the dumb armor knows you don't really want to know that answer. Because <laughs> Cortana just would have told you. Yeah, just be like, yep, you're, you're going to die. But I like all that sort of thing they do really well. Okay, they crash, the, cu- the crew evacuates the ship. Amalea links the self-destruct to her like wristband device, so... To her biometrics, essentially. If she dies, yeah, they're going to blow the prowler. If she dies, it blows up, but if she, she can also trigger it remotely. So they're now, they're moving away from the ship and they're climbing up this like cliff but they're not far enough away yet to guarantee that they're safe and they're trying to find somewhere to hide. But because this is a dusty hell planet, there's like overhangs of dust everywhere and they're like, no, if we let the nuke off, it's going to drop a couple of tons of dust on us and, you know, we'll be fine as Spartans, but you're all going to be crushed. Yep. So they're trying to like figure something out and they eventually send Fred on up the hill and they're like, right, you go up the hill and clear the overhanging dust and then we'll hide on what's left. And Fred scurries his way on up the hill and goes, I found a drainage channel. And they're like, no, you haven't. <laughs> this, is, I'm gonna, this is my entire annoyance about the first couple of chapters of this book. I'm going to raise it in one minute. Uh, he finds this thing anyway, but he doesn't have time to worry about it. So he clears, I think he clears the overhanging dust and he's making his way across the hill when John radios and says, we've got to detonate now. There's people, there's just banshees or seraphs trying to leave the Night Watch. And then Fred suddenly thinks, I see a giant spider and I see what look like two children <laughs> on top yep. of the hill watching something. And he tries to tell them no, but it's too late and they detonate. And then I think Fred is launched off the top of the hill 
into another side of the hill because his armor locks up to protect him. And the two people in the spider that he saw disappear. Chief comes up the hill to go and see if Fred hit his head very hard because he's telling them, I saw this spider thing and I saw these kids and they were definitely humans and no one believes them at all. And I'm just like, you told us in the last book that your armor records everything that happens while you're on the ground, full video and audio. Why didn't you play back the tape for everyone that didn't believe you? That is true. That would have cured, like, three chapters of this book would have stopped with, oh, look, he didn't imagine it. There's video footage of the two children and the big spider thingy. Because then they make fun of him for, like, the next two chapters. Yes, because the other thing he does is he goes, this is clearly a drainage channel of some sort, and that's a road. And they're like, it's not a road, Fred. And he's like, it's definitely a road. Look at it. It's a road. It's a highway. And they have this argument for ages, and he, he starts calling it the Lost Highway chief and that are just humoring him going like sure it is fred yeah definitely and then they even find a foot from the spider thing and fred's like i call that a spider foot and chief's like <laughs> no it's clearly a landing strut off the banshee it's 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 not anything else and he gives it to him it's just like tick tick the spider leg or tick the banshee foot i think it's a stage you're starting to believe him though I don't know. I don't really buy it. It just sounds like they keep humoring him all the time, going like, he's clearly hit his head. He's definitely hit his head. Yeah, he's Fred crazy. And you're just like, wind the tape back. You can do this. <laughs> you're telling me he, he's able to watch other Marines play back from their helmets in Combat Evolved. We know he can do it. We know they're recording it. He can't watch his own? Yeah, it doesn't. it doesn't really make any sense. That's the only thing that annoyed me in this entire book was that we could have cut out three chapters of Fred going, I told you so. Mm, Okay. He has a very good, I do like Fred's character and all of this. He has a great sort of witty, sarcastic, dry sense of humor. Yeah. More Fred, please. And more Fred in games because he he wasn't as, we didn't get enough of him. It's true. It's true. Yeah. (laughs) So what have we got then? Uh, Then they they just start running around the planet. (laughs) Yeah, they go on like their massive long marathon run because Captain Petrov realizes we're not going to get there. It's like it's 60 kilometers to the ship and she's like, what, you guys average 20 kilometers in an hour, give or take? It's like we can do maybe two kilometers in an hour, but probably one. Just run there and run back. It'll be so easy. Yeah, they go to Chief's monologue and he's like, one's being generous, like he's in his head calculating it out going one an hour is very generous. Under the, under the conditions they're in, yeah. Yeah, he's like, you guys run ahead. You go and get to the salvage ship. Uh, and then you're going to bring some way for us to, uh, to rescue us. So they're like, leave them. And then they tear off up the uh, Forgotten Highway. Pretty much. They head up that for a while. And then they find, I can't remember who spots the, the range markers of coal. Uh, Linda. Or Kelly. Kelly, Kelly spots them. They find these and they're like, what does Chief say? And I was like, oh, hmm. imagine that there would be rocks on this cliffside road. And she's hmm. like, but the rocks are a different color. Different type of rock. All right. And then they study them and go, they do kind of look like range markers. And then they suddenly realize it might be an ambush. So they decide to go and do their own ambush for the ambush. <laughs> they <laughs> ambush the ambushers. Yeah. So they go back and they climb up onto the cliff. The other weird thing is this road is set... I think they have a discussion about it at one stage. The road sounds like it's halfway up the cliff. So it's not at the bottom and it's not at the top. Someone dug it out in the middle and they're talking about it. And it's like, well, it's not here long enough to be a human road. It's like the first colonies are only about 150 years old. And that's not enough time to colonize a planet, build a motorway, forget that the planet was here (laughs) and lose all memory of it. So it has to be alien. And I think Kelly says, I was like, well, of course it's alien. Humans would have built the motorway at the top or the bottom of the the cliff, not in the <laughs> middle. And he's like, oh, well, funny. But they have this road and they've decided like, right, it's weird and it's alien. And then they're suddenly like, we may not be alone. So they scurry up to the top of the cliff and they go back a bit. And then they're moving through this weird undergrowth, which I can't get my head around what these plants look like. They're like a weird leaf that they touch that explodes into like flying bugs that look like crystals. Yeah... Those are weird. I, I, I can't get around that at all. And they've got another Aliens. type of plant that looks more like a, sounds more like a Venus flytrap. And then they've got one that looks like it has weird larvae that dangle off the bottom of it. It's all the same, really. They're just weird plants. Sounds like very hostile sort of 
deserty weird stuff. But none of the plants seem like dangerous. They do like some of them grab onto them, but no one seems to like. No one ever gets hurt. No, it might just be a park of Spartan armor that they don't have to worry about these things. But even like in in the end when they go through like the thicket, let's say, no one gets hurt. Do you know what I mean? And they just kind of cut their way through pretty easily. I suppose that's true, yeah. But they like crouch along through the top of this mesa for a bit and then they find a section where the plant life has all been squashed down and then they find another trail and they suddenly realise there's some sort of big creature or vehicle has come through and left a track and they realise it's a lot bigger than what they thought it was because at first they thought it was just one narrow track and then they realise it's a whole big thing and then they spot the spider buggy. I like the spider buggies actually. (laughs) They sound ridiculous. They're very close to steampunk, which I think is very dangerous. We don't want steampunk in our halo. That is true. But they did have microwave beams. Microwave beams are not steampunk. Yeah, it's it sounded like something you'd see in a Fallout game. Like, it sounded a weird mix of like this crazy microwave weapon with a steam-powered engine. Do you know what it engine. sounded like it would have come from? Do you remember that Disney movie from a couple of years ago that they spent a fortune on with the guy that goes to Mars, the cowboy? I only just watched it again. John something. Carter. John Carter. John Carter. It sounded like something out of that. Some weird oval shaped platform with legs on it that has a weird crystal y laser gun. Except it also has a steam engine on the back of it. And the engine is used to recharge the batteries in the actual machine. Which is the only reason it's not steampunk. They see these. I think there's four of them, and three of them do a runner, and then one of them doubles back to like take on chief i think the short version is they get fred with the micro be- the microwave beam his armor shuts down immediately assuming that it's like being emp'd they're able to burn the plants and stuff but before they can take out chief the spartans shoot back take out the microwave gun injure one of them and then the driver of the spider buggy uses the spider buggy to like immobilize chief it climbs over the top of him and then sits on him <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> uh, because I, is it, I, I can't remember, it's Linda or Kelly and they're, they're like, Chief. And he's like, I'm here underneath it. And then he tries to push it off thinking, I've pushed warthogs before. So he starts to push it up and then it lifts its legs up further and squashes him. He's like, I'm pinned, I need help. <laughs> <laughs> this this isn't going to move this way. So they eventually get them to like stand down. They do a lot of damage to them and then they start yelling threats at them. <laughs> That's right. They shoot out the uh, they shoot out the boiler on the back of it, and then they get them to come out, and they have a little back and forth where they're like, "Yes, we're humans," and honestly, we are. And they get Fred to take his helmet off and show that they're humans. And then the kids are like, "You can't be humans. Humans never get that big." They yeah. call them something else at first. Scabs aliens. or something. Them aliens. They call them like scab scum or something, which isn't aliens. I assume there's like another. There have to be, like, more than one group of castaways on this planet, I wonder. I don't think so. Because it seemed like they were prepared to fight someone else, but they definitely... They thought they were aliens. But they didn't face the Covenant before now. They didn't see the Covenant, probably. No, but they see something that isn't identifiable as readily as humans, so they just assume it's alien. Given the fact that they're living on a world in a city, in an alien city that isn't human, they're aware of the fact that aliens exist, you know? just don't know what they are. That's very true. Yeah, Blue Team patched them up and then offered to help them get off planet if they'll help them out too and call off the rest of their friends that are away on to they figure out that the other three spider buggies are also on their way to the lucky break and they suddenly realise that everyone's going to the one place. <laughs> well, and also they want the spider machine so they can move a bit faster. Yes, they've realised we have a bit of transport now. We could pick up the marines and we could do stuff. They take the spider buggy and they take the castaways until the batteries run out and then they have the sudden realisation that we can't recharge it because we shot up the... Uh... The boiler, yeah. Also, why why does armour not come with a power output? <laughs> why is <laughs> there not a USB socket or something on it? You could <laughs> Yeah, USB charge it. Yeah, the reactor in those suits goes for something like 20 years. That is true. They could definitely have plugged someone in there and like used them as a battery. I don't know if they would gone and messed around with their armor on such a hostile planet where they are totally reliant on their armor to keep them going. 
I I find it suspicious that Catherine Halsey would not have thought of a situation where they might need power. Uh, I do appreciate the fact that they made comments on we should have more grenades and why don't we have more or more rocket launchers and we should ask Halsey to install a rocket launcher in our armor next time. I thought it's like cool. we should we should get her to make we should get her design like a smaller portable version. I'm like I go for a small portable rocket launcher. <laughs> like and also uh, yet another book that has an underslung grenade launcher that I want. I want an underslung grenade launcher. I want an underslung regular grenade launcher and then I want an underslung sticky launcher because now that we're friends with the elites we can do this shit. Plasma caster? I'm telling you. An assault rifle or a BR with a plasma caster on the bottom's amazing. What more do you want in life? Halo weapon needs attachments. Also, at the very least, we could have the castaway slings to launch grenades with, because they did a pretty good job. They did. They did. With grenades, I thought it was cool. Yeah, you guys don't have the best weapons, so here, have some explodey rocks. I did love, that's the one thing I did like about the castaways, I loved when they were talking to each other, how like they had some concepts and understood some words, but not others, like units of time and distance. I thought it was interesting, like, when they were trying to communicate, like, plans of action to them and, like, try to make them understand things and they just couldn't. And I love the way John did it in terms of, like, calculated heartbeats for the measurement of time. I thought that was amazing. I thought that was really clever. Is it breaths, isn't it? Yeah, you've taken, like, three, four breaths in the last... 15 seconds or something. He's like, it's 900 breaths in an hour. So, And they're like, oh, we've got loads of time until the Covenant come get us. And he's like... No, you've got 900 breaths. That's not a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. Krista, I'm a little fuzzy on the next bit. I'm, oh. I'm tagging you in. They use the spider machine and they go to one of the other downed ships. Pretty much they split up now. Kelly stays behind with the two wounded guys. And they take uh, the character Lena, uh, who is probably one of the more interesting kids. So, like, she has a bit of a rapport with John. They get an emergency call. Isn't that why they split up? Don't they get a call from the Wheatley? Um, so yeah, I think they split up here where like Kelly stays behind with the kids and then they take the walker to go to the Wheatley, essentially. I think the walker broke down. I think this is when they do their like 20k run, is it? They do, they do, a, lot, they do a lot of running. They have to do the sprint to get to the Phyllis Wheatley, I think. And then the Silent Shadows... Like scout team, yeah, they land where the walker was because then oh, Kelly yeah. and the Kelly kids have to the... Kelly has to fight them off out. them, yeah. And that's when they drop the two. That's when the th- the super uh, spirit comes down, which is a three pronged spirit that dropped two umbras, right? Two umbras, which are the troop transports from Halo Two. In case you weren't sure what they were, because I was kind of sure, but also wasn't. Yeah, well, in Halo 2, they have, like, ghosts underneath them, but there are troop transport versions of them that are right. just have slide doors on either side, and they just have compartments that kind of, like, kind of like a spirit that opens up either side and troops come out. They kind of have bays like that as well, where, like, they're described later as being coffin-like. With airbags, I like the idea that they vacuum pack them like an Amazon purchase. <laughs> yes. They just seal you up in airbags, and then they let you out at the far side, but at least it's air-conditioned. Yes, everyone gets a nice air conditioning break. So the silent shadow drop and then Kelly just murders murders the crew of one Umbra and then the other Umbra escapes, right? Yeah, and it heads after Chief and the rest of Blue Team. No, doesn't she go to Petrov? She goes back. She goes back to Petrov to pick up the Marines. The other Umbra heads after Chief. Oh, she yeah, takes yeah, yeah. the one that they took out. They go back and collect... Petrov and 16 Marines after they have like an argument about there's too many people so yeah. they leave the crew of the Prowler and they leave the ki- no they don't leave the kids behind no they take the kids with them but they take the kids, the kids in the troop bay and then Petrov's like I ride shotgun yeah and yeah, Lynn yeah. is like really mad and she's kind of out of it at this stage because she's getting distracted and fantasizing about mud baths with champagne and then I think at one stage they say, it's like, shit, I'm th- I'm talking when I should be listening. And then she's like, shit, I'm thinking when I should be listening. And she's just really, like, not functioning well. Yeah, they do a great job of just, like, the heat is obviously getting to her. Yeah, it's, and I think they say, like, they've lost a couple of Marines since Blue Team left. Yeah, lost a whole, whole bunch. They all, what do they do? They bail into the Umbra and then they have to play a catch-up with everyone else. Yes, and then, meanwhile, John... Fred and Linda find another group of castoffs, right? 
they get to the end of the battle, but I think doesn't it switch back to Nizat? Because then we have the battle that's taken place between the Lucky Break and the Wheatley, because that's what Blue Team arrive at the end of. Yeah. Because yes. they have this battle where they launch like cables across the canyon and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. That happens a little, yeah, that's a little bit because like Nazat then decide, realizes that he doesn't have enough time to let the humans come and take the ship, that he has to bring the luminaries to the humans. That's right. <laughs> yeah, then he starts like hunting down Blue Team to give him the luminaries. Well, that's it. But when he realizes there's Spartans on the planet, he's like, oh shit, we can't let Spartans on the ship because they'll take it. Yeah, he's like, we can't stop them. Yeah, he's no belief that they can actually prevent the Spartans from doing this. So he's like, we'll have to change up our tactics. He ODSTs his way onto the planet, doesn't he? Because I think he yeah, was in he orbit. Does. And then he's like, he, was. he takes uh, Lakosi with him. And he's like, we got to go, dude. And he's like, we're, we're. I think he runs a plan by him. And Lakosi kind of comes up with the same plan. And he's like, all right, you're with me. Yeah, I got very much the impression Lakosi had all the great ideas. As a fleet master, I felt Lakosi, he always like went, deferred to him and had true ideas past him. And Lakosi would always come back, I think most times with something better and um, he was very good in, in certain situations where like he had certain element of foresight he kind of knew what he was doing and the cozy kind of was the second guessing him all uh, most of the time but like i think respectfully as opposed to like we've seen other sanghili not be respectful and then did they die <laughs> and they die essentially i'm thinking back to we just finished legacy of onyx you know where you see where second in commands are always trying to maybe one up their leaders and there's a bit of tension there but i think nazak he i think in the situation what he was trying to do i think he he was made sense because clearly the humans weren't able to take the ship with everything that happened and especially with the spartans he's like okay we have to get on to the weekly and leave the artifacts behind yeah we need it we need to attack the ship and then be repelled and we are going to drop these on the way back out the airlock or something and then that plan devolves into, uh, we're going to throw you big elite at them and they're going to kill you and they're going to take your body with them. And that's how this is going to work. And the elite's like, all right. He's like, I am so honored. I'm like, okay. Like, no, you idiots. But I like how they go to attack the Wheatley and then the crew realize what's happening. So they decide to evac the Wheatley. And they're trying to get down onto this evacuated road and the elites are launching ropes across the canyon to like abseil down or zipline across to the other side to get up. And it's all a bit of a clusterfuck. At first they think the humans are coming to attack them and then like, why aren't the humans like staying and attacking us? And they suddenly realise the humans are trying to get down onto the road. They're trying to get to the tunnel essentially so that they can hold prevent them from getting to the ship i think is, is what was happening as well yeah that was one of those like nizat moments where he's like lakosi what does this look like to you and nizat's looking at the road and lakosi's like that's a fucking tunnel and nizat's like <laughs> what tunnel and then he looks and goes oh shit there is a tunnel i was looking at the road and he's like no tunnel's more important and they have this like back and forth because there's a couple of times you get that and it's just like you'd be so much trouble without lakosi or there to help you it's true. They, they they have a good relationship. Well, they'd need to, the way the story ends, when we get <laughs> yeah. that far. When we get that far. The battle goes poorly. The Covenant don't get over to the Wheatley, and the crew of the Wheatley get down the road a bit and set up like their best defensive line. And then the Covenant try to charge them, and the commander of the Wheatley, who's not a Marine, panics and... Uh, lets his booby trap go early and it turns out they had rigged part of the cliff with explosives but i did think it was cool when they commented on like this is we're kind of jumping a little bit at us because i think john and fred meet up with like the cast offs before this and have a yeah, quick, quick exchange and they kind of broke a kind of a truce and a deal where john says we're going to get you off this planet and what you want you want this like old pirate corvette well yeah we'll Shark get to one we'll bring, it to, and we'll bring it to any planet you, planet you want i say that now because that becomes important at the end of the book i think anyway then they're pretty much okay we need your transports to kind of like well essentially we need you to not attack the ship they're like okay so john and fred go running after the ship they send linda after the wheatley the crew of the wheatley to go to them so then john realizes now okay we're, we're spread pretty thin but if the crew of Lucky Break have left to go run after the crew of the Wheatley. There must be almost nobody left on the actual ship. So we'll go and try and take it. 
So he pretty much does a cool scene of them taking out, out some banshees and having this kind of the ship. What would they, they call them? NATOs? What were those kind of ships that came there? Like fighter jets, essentially, that came down a wrecked shop. Yeah, they're like human. They sound like a human space fighter that aren't really good for like atmospheric combat. I'm looking at. They're not mentioned at all in Halopedia yet in the vehicles section, but they, they're referred to as NATOs. And, I, and true, what the hell could they be? I don't know. They were awesome. So they pretty much came in and wrecked the Banshees. Like, NATO fighter. Actually, this is the first appearance. Nadado fighter. Sorry. Nadado fighter. They're what's part of what's left of the wolf pack that's in orbit, which are still getting their asses kicked by the Silent Shadow this whole time. I got the impression they were giving a pretty good fight, though. It's a, But I think the only reason they're giving a pretty good fight is because the Silent Shadow weren't there to destroy them. The Silent Shadow are still, like, waiting to see what the hell's going on with the defectors. Yeah. Yeah. Their their goal is to just kill him and take the Luminary Beacons back, really. Yeah, they're there, they're there for Cavarossi, and that's what they're there for. And the humans are kind of... The part of their trap is that they're... I think the Silent Shadow are on the other side of the planet, and they're like, if the rebels want to escape, they've either got to fly past us or fly past the humans, and neither way they're fucked. And this is how they're keeping them on the planet. That's why they Nazak made his ships break orbit and show up so that they lure the humans in between to have the humans fight the Silent Shadow fleet, essentially. So, anyway, the point I'm getting is that, like, the ship they were trying to capture when Fred and John get close to it, it pretty much takes off. It takes off and flies away. Oh, so the that, lucky break, yeah. Yeah. Just like, bye. And then that immediately, like, confirms to John. He's like, nope, this was all a setup. It wasn't actually a setup to get the Spartans there, which he thought it was. It's a setup, essentially, obviously, to give the luminaries to the humans he thinks and he said it to halsey that he thinks the red armored elites are a hunter killer team set up to take out spartans he doesn't realize that they're the silent shadow and that it just happened to be that one got obsessed with him in the yeah. previous thing he now thinks the silent shadow might be there yeah. just purely to get spartans wrong <laughs> probably not quite yeah he, yeah he's wrong but he obviously you can see as being something the covenant would do yeah Secretly, because they probably wouldn't want to acknowledge the success or even the threat that they pose. That's probably where the demon comes from. They'll be demon slayers. Yeah, yeah, true. And then the doom slayer was created to take out the Spartans. Oh. oh. Anyway, I just thought it was cool. So then Fred and John then have to turn around and run back. So much running. There's so much running. It's just like oh. a lot of running. But then they get back onto the walkers. Essentially, of Ro- Rochelle and Samson are like the leaders of the cast off. They're like the oldest. Um, so they're kind of in like their late or kind of they're sorry their very early 20s is how they're kind of yeah they're all gaunt and starved so like their ages are kind of indeterminate but like obviously their lifespans are quite short which is kind of horrible it is yeah and i thought they did a great job of like how blue team reacted so like so strongly to the idea of marooning and that the fact that that's highly illegal and kind of against all the laws that nobody would like from the way they describe it it's the worst crime you can commit like it's yes. the only I think they say it's the only crime the UN specifically say can't be used as a punishment for anything. Yeah. You can't maroon some no matter what they do, you could chuck them out an airlock and it's probably still more humane than marooning them on a planet. Especially a hostile one like this. Yeah, that's that they that you know that you're just leaving them to die and suffer. So the book is kind of a little bit this well, the characters are kind of all over the place here because you've got John and Fred now kind of like at the ship kind of around having to go back. You have Linda, who's running after the crew of the Wheatley and eventually catches up. And then you have Kelly, who's gone back to get all the Marines and bring them. Essentially, she was supposed to pretty much help take the ship. Um, So they're all kind of meeting in around this kind of canyon. So I did think it was cool that, like, obviously the crew of the Wheatley has, like, been very clever, even though they're not, like, Marines, let's say. They're, they've been excellent in terms of, like, how they've defended themselves with the, their own strength and how they're very clever with the defenses of the ship like holding one turret back. I thought that was a great scene of like all the elites trying to take the ship and the ship just mowing them down into pieces. I thought that was real cool. The thing that they raise in that that I thought was really interesting was when Nazat is trying to figure out what the relevance of 12s are to humans. Yeah. Oh yeah, the dozen. Because we don't think about it. You go, a dozen makes perfect sense. And he's like, 
humans don't do things in batches of tens. They focus on twelves. And he's like, I find it really suspicious that there are only ten guns on this ship. There must be some more. We've killed a five, so there must be a sixth. On weapons this side go of the in ship. twelves. Fleets go in twelves. Ships go in twelves. He says weapons get packed in crates in twelves or twenty fours. And you're like, oh, I suppose we do do dozens a lot. <laughs> it is kind of a weird number. And yeah. he's like, they have it. It's such a significant number that they have a special word for it. They call it a dozen. It's cool, actually. <laughs> it's an interesting um, observation. Is it a dozen dozens or a gross? And he's like yeah. completely into it. It's like they just as aliens, they have no clue why we do things as a dozen. To be fair, as a human, I don't know why we do things as a dozen, but we do for fun. And he's he's like something's up here. So when they send the first vehicles forward to test it, and then some of them get a blitter, he's like fucking knew it. It's like there's another gun, damn it. And they're using the we've brought back the uh, what do you call it guns? The focus rifles. Oh, yeah. I hate the focus rifles. I saw them in the book, and I'm like, oh, they're not going to kill shit with those. <laughs> but it turns out they're very good for taking out equipment, which seems to be like their, their main purpose, because that's immediately what the Covenant decided they were going to do, was get the focus rifle people into position and then take out the turrets on the ship, which probably makes sense, because focus rifles are terrible for anything else, but if you're hitting a stationary target, they're probably all right. Yeah, not as bad. Not as bad at all. Still pretty bad though. I just sorry, I just wanted to butt in there about the twelves. I know, I do I do really like the twelve thing. It was really interesting. It's interesting when we get a perspective a weird perspective on things like that. Yeah, because it's not something you would ever really think about, but what happens after this? We get That's when they that's when like the big quote unquote final battle happens. The Wheatley detonates at some point, doesn't it? Doesn't it get bombed? That's right. Does the it? bomber comes down. No, the weekly doesn't get bombed. The week they blow the weekly when they're evacuating. The silent the the covenant are running to the lucky break, and they're retreating to it. And chief and the other people think that the covenant might have taken command codes on data pads from dead crew of the weekly. So they decide they've got to hunt down the covenant that- and take them out. But like Fred and Linda are say like it doesn't matter what they've taken. Yeah, they've taken something, so we have to stop them. It doesn't really matter what it is. They, they can't decide, oh, they must have done something, because why would they just run? That doesn't yes, make sense. now they're suddenly retreating. They must have got what they wanted, which means we need to do acid denial again. Which And we know what they got, what they wanted. They just wanted them to take the luminary beacons. Which they successfully managed to hide in a human device and on a crazy suicidal elite that they sent forward. Because I think at one point before that, Chief finds another one of those heavy armored elites and the shield detonator or the shield generator has exploded. So then this one immediately sticks out to them. They're like, this guy hasn't blown up yet. We need to take him and we need to take the entire body. Yes, the only scientist, Chief's like, okay, we'll tear it out. And he's like, no, you can't. We need to take the whole thing. I was like, w- what if we tear the armor off? No, we need the whole thing. He's like, we can't risk damaging this. We need everything. And we'll figure it out later. And that's how they end up taking the bug with them. The bug. And then we've got this run through the thorns. They're like, are they thorns? The kind of thorns? It's a, they call it, refer to it as like a barricade, a thicket. It's like a very dense vegetation that is semi-sentient. It seems to be reaching for like people and kind of hooking them on with barbs and stuff like that. I don't like plants that move. Yeah, It doesn't seem to be overly dangerous because the elites have kind of cut their way through it. And John and, you know, they realize it's a trap, but like they have to carry, they go through in like squads of four and they very quickly and I think very like obviously identify the trap and kind of like spring it back. But um, it has like John running through the thicket, bursting all these kind of things around him as he goes through. So it's kind of cool. And then it has like the Marines running through it as well and they seem fine. And then they come back to the trail. It, it's weird. When it, it's hard to envision. It's something truly alien, you know, this plant life. You know, it's an interesting sequence, especially what what happens next. So this is the part where they're like going through the caves, right? Like they go into the cave, they're trying to get to the lucky break or that area. John's trying to call for evac. It's not, yeah, these are the, the thickets. It's not really a cave. It's just they're in going through this heavy vegetation. Yeah. To get through this kind of barrier. But like, yeah, John's uh, request for an evac, a hotline, which is one of the coolest things I will say in this book. I freaking loved it. 
of what it actually is we'll talk about it later but getting the hotline and like all the marines like what the hell is a hotline like i don't it's know like you don't want to know so john requests like an evac because there's pelicans coming down they've contacted the ship uh the the fighter pack above and they're coming down essentially to rescue ex- extract all the marines and the castaways and then some more silent shadows well, Nizat's like stalking them at this point, and then the silent shadows start coming down, and they're like, "Ah, shit!" Sorry, Nizat has a cool moment where he like realizes where everything is and gets super excited about the fact that the Spartans are coming up behind him. They're they're coming to save him. Yeah, he's like, "I have a perfect solution to our problem." Of the and he's constantly in fear of the silent shadow coming for him. So like, they come down on their dropship, and he's like, "This is gonna be perfect." So he hides in the thicket and essentially sets up the Spartans to take them out for him and that that's pretty much what happens and it's it's cool. It's a very very clever it's one of his brighter ideas. It is, yeah. And so during the battle between the Spartans and the Silent Shadow, which doesn't actually last very long, the Spartans take him out pretty easily. Even the Marines are the ones with the rocket launchers, so I thought that was they wreck shop. And then so Nizat just starts kinda like creeping around and Chief sees him and he's like, ah shit, now I gotta take out this Joker. Uh, and then they kind of run out of time and they have to hotline before Nizat actually, they actually get to confront Nizat, right? They like just go off and hotline after that. They don't actually go after him. They don't. They pretty much chalk it up to being uh, unsuccessful, that being failed, that it's not worth it because they've run out of time. So he, Chief sends all the Marines back to the extraction point and says it leaves because Blue Team can run and make it. So, like, they stay longer and try and take out the Nazat's group of marines as they are a group of singly as they run for the ship. And then, pretty much, John is like, we've got to evac. And then this new fighter called the Gigas fighter comes down and it's part of the Silent Shadow and it pretty much f- it bombs the Lucky Break and destroys it as Nazat is running towards it. And then that massive explosion pretty much heralds the fucking end of the mission because the ship's dead. And John and the Blue Team are like, right, we gotta extract, we're out of here. And then, so before we actually talk about the hotlining, and then we kind of get the end of Nizat's story in a way. So the silent, the silent shadow drop down, and they confront Nizat, and they're like, "All right, man, nowhere to where's run. Where's our ship? Where, where are the, where's the luminary beacons?" And he's like, uh, "I don't, I don't have them." Yeah, he's like, uh, "Did, did my ship, the so and so, survive?" Or he's like, "Which ship survived?" And I'll tell you. And the guy tells him, he's like. Oh, well, the beacons are gone and the receivers were in one of the ships that didn't survive, even though he now knows that the ship that he needed to survive is still there. Yeah. yeah. So he, he's like very clever. He's like, OK, the plan survives without me no matter what happens next, because he he expects to be decapitated. Which you pretty much believe now sets up the next book. But yeah, he gets it's even it's interesting how like the Covenant will do this without beating an eye after they're setting up that it's such a terrible thing that the humans won't do it. Yeah, they just they just tell them to strip. They're like strip. He's like, you're gonna kill me with your, um, you're gonna kill me without my armor on, and they're like, no, worse, we're fucking just leaving you here. And you find out later that they actually go to the bother of putting a minefield around the planet. Yeah, yeah. The, these motherfuckers are here forever. They are stuck. That's it. It's just like we've mined the planet. You don't get picked up ever again. You you stay here. Well, and also a little spoilers for the human part. We learn that Petrov, the Oni agent, gets left here too, thinking that she's going to establish establish a base here. Actually, yeah, she thinks someone's coming back to collect her later because of course they will. And then we find out, nah, they mind the orbit of the planet. We can't go back for her. They can't even get a signal out. And you can't like, even contact her, yeah. So she doesn't even know, but we're a little ahead of ourselves. But the Silent Shadow literally are just like, all right, bye. <laughs> they just leave him there and then... uh do you want to talk about the hotline? Yeah, I want to talk about the hotline. Talk about the hotline. The Marines are at the extraction point. The There's a Pelican coming in, and it's being protected by the, the Nidato fighters, and they're like literally blowing up anything that comes near them. They sound badass, and they're pretty much protecting this Pelican because it's got like some pretty important cargo on it. The Marines are set up and they're like, they have these harnesses and they're holding these things up in their air, in their arm. And then it makes a notion that Kelly gets there first, she's fast, and she just holds up her arm. And she makes a comment, oh yeah, because Spartans don't need a rig for what's coming. And I was like, I think I know what's coming. Because in my brain, I'm seeing um, this, uh, what is called a skyhook extraction, which Batman. is a real thing. It's in Batman, but it's in loads of other things. It's a real thing that the CIA, I think it was the CIA, developed it for like extractions out of... um. 
hot zones. Hostile countries. Hostile countries. So it's a, it's amazing. So essentially, the pelican drops this like almost AI controlled uh, cable that has hooks coming off it. And essentially, the Marines are hooking up onto this cable as the Kelican flies overhead and just pulls them and keeps going. And it's an excellent image of just it picking up each Marine and then each member of Spoo Team and then John Last just grabs onto this line. It says, like, the AI will, like, try and find you with the hook within a certain parameter. Um, So, like, it's kind of smart that way. So it sounds awesome. Like, <laughs> it sounds so cool. And then it just grabs all of them. And he, he says something before they do this of, like, when they're extra, when, before, when they're evacuating, he says, Blue Team, rearm up because you may have to shoot your way out of the extraction. And I was like, what the hell does he mean? They're not going to shoot out of a pelican. They always close the doors and ramp off. But it's because they're hanging on a wire. They may have to shoot things while they're hanging, hanging. on this wire <laughs> off this pelican. It sounds incredible. It's such a dramatic and excellent way to extract. So they don't get under attack, which is which is cool. But like they essentially get like pulled back in once they're like out of the combat area. But it sounds it was amazing. It was such a great great scene. And then you have like all the kind of ramification what happened kind of happening now because on this pelican is like the cargo, the dead elite with the battery pack and with with his shield unit intact and a few of the cast offs and stuff. And then you can go into the fact that, like, there's a weirdness around what happens to Petrov, I think. Well, there's, like, a whole hearing after this. Yeah, so the, there is a conversation that happens where Petrov is saying to John in earshot of the cast-offs, Rochelle, that we should leave them behind. There's enough room on the transports for all the UNSC, just not them and the cast-offs. So, like, she's pretty much like, fuck these guys. The mission is comes first. They don't matter. And John's like, hell no. I ain't doing that because I was a good boy. <laughs> it is true, though. It's nice to have, like, this... In this hearing, you have Cole and you have Halsey, which is really, really nice. It's always nice to have them in a scene together. And then what do we have? We have Stanforth as well. Yeah, and Cole has pretty much made his mind up. He's like, blue team are getting off with this. It's cool. Yeah, they have the other... The JAG, the, the kind of military lawyers, almost there as well. To like inquire one that's that that's very much on the side of the castoffs, making sure that they kind of get what they want, that they they get treated fairly, and it's also like an inquisition over like Petrov being left behind and not understanding what that meant, believing that someone was coming back for her and they're not, and then it's almost hinted at because Rochelle is very much, hey, come use my walker, the walker that breaks down and leaves her behind. And then results in her being left behind. It, 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 I got this sense that it was engineered that she got left there. Oh, very much. Yeah, she, Rochelle knew that she was going to leave them behind in a heartbeat. So she's like, I'm going to leave you You're going to take the dodgy one. The player played the other one. So it was deliberate. But everyone brushes it off going, no, no, she definitely said go on without me. Because she's sitting there the whole time thinking to herself, I'm going to get a promotion. <laughs> Is like, I'm going to get promoted, I'm going to be awesome, I'm going to set up an advanced base here, this is going to be great, and has no idea that meanwhile the silent shadow in orbit going, mine, 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 mine. Yeah. and you're stuck here forever. But basically, they're trying to, they're kind of, so, it's Stanforth that's like kind of trying to blame Blue Team for this, and Halsey and Cole are like, uh, no, and John's like, uh, no, and then you have Lena and our Oscar, no, we have what? Roselle and Samson? Rochelle and Samson, yeah. I love Roselle, like, when John talks, she's like, oh my god, you're John! And John's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's me. It's me, John. <laughs> look at me. Yeah, I look this good. <laughs> I'm amazing. Basically what happens is, uh, they're just trying to figure out what to do with the cast-offs. And they're like, we promised them a shark fin. And they're like, uh, like, Stanforth is like, what? And they're like, uh, Cole's like, yeah, that's doable. No one has basically told the cast-offs that you want a very outdated piece of crap ship, and the only reason everyone's going M is because where the fuck do we find a shark fin? It's not that it's not that it, too dangerous to give them. It's like, I don't think we can do this. It's, I also got the impression it was very clear that shark fin was a very popular ship because it was good for piracy, which is kind of what they wanted for. But it was, it was good for piracy back in the day is the exactly. thing. Exactly, like, yeah, yeah. This was top of the range a hundred years ago, and you're like, I don't know if we can find one of these somewhere because I think Cole's like, we. I'm sure we can turn one up somewhere. We'll dig it up, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, everything comes in full circle because the, they're like, well, where do you want to live, kids? And the kids are like, we want to go to Gao. 
And or I was like, fuck, yeah, you do. Because that's one of the most important planets in the recent Halo lore of, like, all the books are, like, based on all these kind of characters that are from there and go there. Because it's an insurrectionist planet, and it's an insurrectionist planet after the war. Yeah, it's pretty much in full rebellion now. And then Hector Nito is name-dropped as well. Yeah, from the first book. His prowlers are hiding out there now, too. It's like, these guys want to go there, so obviously we're going to take them back to this planet, and then Blue Team are going to have more adventures. Potentially, but which is kind of weird to think that they're... Uh, I don't think they can do too much on that planet in this time period. Because of the last light? Yeah, because so much has already happened there later, so like... Uh, I don't think how it can do that much, but especially because Blue Team were on that planet and never mentioned once about the castoffs, you know, in in Last Light. I'd imagine the castoffs will just go their own way. That's what I think will happen. Yeah, maybe they they go there or like whatever happens at the end of the next story probably wraps up maybe the those rogue prowlers or something. That opening you know? chapter will be getting them to the planet and then it'll be, oh, well, by the way, while you're there, we have a fix on the prowlers and we need you to go and take them out. And then you get Hector Nito and stuff like that. But Blue Team, of course, will fail because those prowlers and Hector survive. And Yeah, we already know that kind of stuff. That's the problem with writing books like the, these that are so far in the past. We kind of know nothing's going to happen to Blue Team, nothing's going to happen to John. Yeah, I think that's the thing about these books that maybe I didn't like as much as Silent Storm is there were more characters I liked in Silent Storm and I was afraid of whether or not they were going to live or die. I think I said during the Silent Storm one, there were a couple of times where I was still convinced that Johnson would die, even Hmm. though I know (laughs) Johnson. But there's a really good sort of like fear the whole way. Whereas in this, Petrov's a horrible person, so I don't really care that she's stuck on that planet. She deserved it. You don't really get that attached to the cast-offs, and there isn't really another big human character. No. All the, like, the book is mainly about Blue Team and the Spartans, and the thing is, we already know what happens to Blue Team and the Spartans, so there's not any sense of uh, threat. Yeah, well, it's a, you know, it's a Master Chief story, so I guess it's all about developing him and his team, and it's... All the books always do great jobs of doing that because obviously they can tell way more about what a character is thinking um, than a game can do. So it does help build John's character, which I appreciate, and has some interesting things in terms of what Linda and Kelly. I think Linda has some great scenes and dialogue in this book, which I appreciate. Yes, which I really do. I like it when Linda was off on her own with some of the cast-offs for yeah. just a little bit. It was like a chapter or two, but when Linda's the only person in the scene, it makes... It basically forces the writer to actually give her a voice and a personality because Linda's a very overlooked character and I really like her. Also, I just realized something. Something that kind of bugged me in this book is they're all wearing their like Halo 5 armor. Well, in terms of their helmets, it sounds like it. Like Kelly's being described as having that. The bubble helmet. The bubble helmet. Which they should all be in just the just the Halo CE armor. We're conveniently back to the Silent Storm. We're testing prototypes that you're going to wear later. Oh, yeah. I don't mind that too much because it helps give them a visual distinction in your brain. And like you have an image because like you don't really have an image of what they what these Spartans look like, their faces. But you have an image of their armor and their helmets. So like it does help you visually see the people, the blue team move. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, the cover art has what John looks like. They don't really describe Linda and Fred's uh, armors, I don't think, do they? It's just Kelly's that's really, she's the most identifiable, and they use that to kind of describe her from a distance. It kind of makes sense. Yeah. I don't mind it. Yeah. And here's the other problem with, like, Master Chief, is every time he takes has to take off his helmet in a scene, it's basically like, you're, you're, looking, you're still looking at a character with no face. Because hmm. he's never really described, we don't know what he looks like, it's kind of... Not as an adult, but they do describe him as a teenager. I'm pretty sure he's in comics and is too like fully un- unmasked. And we've we've seen like really young John in cutscenes where he's got the freckles and stuff like that. But I mean, we're getting there. The TV show will probably show us his face, so we'll see. We have that actor. I'd be very surprised if they don't show his face. Anyway, do we want to talk about the epilogue? Epilogue where they're stranded on the planet. Yes. I, I really like this setup, actually, and I wish they would do a short story that kind of goes into this a little more. 
oh, there's definitely something in the third book for about this. 100% these guys are coming back. But um, it's uh, Petrov. Well, it's it's from the view of Nizat, but they're looking at Petrov, and she's sitting there over a fire. They've been there for a couple days because they're talking about endless days, endless nights, you know, back and forth. So they've been there for a while, maybe a week or so. And they're watching Petrov, like, boil these plants. And she's, she's like, got... Yeah, she's, like, barbecuing the leaves and throwing them in big sacks. And she's got, like, 20 of them or so going. And she just keeps doing it over and over again. And uh, Nizat and... Uh, what's his name? Uh, Lakosi are talking. And Lakosi's like... No, Nizat's like, we should... No, Lakosi's like, we should just kill her and eat her, <laughs> basically. Yeah, he's like, we're all hungry. There's not much meat on her, but there's still some meat. We could eat her. And Nizat's like... How many leaves do you think that woman can actually eat? They bring up a really good point that I never thought about. They're like, what if she's feeding more than just herself? And you're like, shit, was she was she like dumped on her own or not? Or were there other people with her? I was thinking she knew the elites were there and she was just cooking extra for like a piece 100%. thing. hundred percent. Well, these were the two things I thought was one, is she there with other soldiers or... Is other she going off. to try and like? Is she going to? Yeah, there could be other create off. some sort of weird coalition with the elites. I thought she was looking for a coalition. Yeah. Yeah, me too. She might even be like pissed that she got left behind. I'm telling you, you imagine the third book where the out of left field enemy is a Petrov a Cavarossi tag team. That could would be. be amazing. That would be great. His other friend comes and rescues him with his like stealth fleet. But there's only two ships left in that, so they would find something. They go, they they go meet up with Atriox. <laughs> Cavarosi did say that if they could, if he could, if the guys left on the ship could find where Oni were, there's a chance for redemption. So yeah. unless they decide they find they find a facility or they find a colony world and think that this is Oni, and then the prophets allow them to take them off the planet, there'd be something. I guess they could find... I'm sure the minefield has a way to, like, disable it or something like that, so... They have a way around it somehow. Petrov seems devious enough that she would totally form an alliance with rogue elites and go rogue herself. Which would be an amazing story. That would be interesting. I'd like to see that. Because, I mean, we've already in... um, It was kind of already established in Silent Storm that the elites will work with humans tentatively because... The main bad guy in Silent Storm was working with the insurrectionists for a bit. That's how they got, like, the Spartan information and uh, blueprints and stuff. I'm getting, like, Halsey and uh, Junon Dam of kind of vibes here. Like, it could totally be done. But I like the way they left it open, where either she's with- cooking more food because there's more people with her. Humans either cast-offs or marines that got left behind and they're still alive. Or there could pot- potentially be... um. She was feeding the elites or like getting ready like to offer something up. I would like that. I think that would be really cool. Okay, so that's kind of a good overview of the book. I think this is I I feel like this book is kind of awkward because it's a middleman kind of like leading to, you know, the big finale of this trilogy or whatever it ends up being. But uh overall I I thought it was okay. I thought the stakes weren't super high. Yeah, I think it's a good solid like seven or eight book yeah definitely silent storms like a nine and this is good but not as good because like you said it's it's all very quick it's non-stop it's just one short mission and the stakes are we gonna get these kids off this planet and we might get a covenant ship out of it yeah it's it's pretty weak honestly like not the book but just the stakes and the mission and stuff the stakes will always be weak when we have blue team as the lead characters because we know that they survive. So like there's always going to be a sense of it's always going to be the supporting cast or will or not the mission will be successful. Honestly, blue team needs like a Veda or someone that could possibly die. Like we need less we need more characters around blue team, I think, that we care about. Yeah, which is I think what they did well with the first book and that you had Johnson and you had other people Crowder developed stuff, a cool yeah. character and then there were the people that were at risk even though like yes we know johnson survives but still um i will say shout out to the lovely moment where lena elena says kelly you're obviously john's favorite oh my god i was that like, was Whoa. so awkward and i really enjoyed it 
Kelly even like had second thoughts. She's like, uh. Uh, am I his favorite? Did he just leave me behind because he didn't want me to get hurt? Which is what Lena Lin is suggesting. That like it's obviously clear to her that she's John's favorite. Otherwise, why didn't they leave Jin or uh, Linda or Fred? And uh, I thought that was awesome. Just the concepts of like them having favorites, but like also the fact that she says I really care for John and I hope that he cares the same way for me. I was like, oh. I was like, uh oh, no, no, no. Then I started thinking about things. It was like. Kelly is one of John's first friends and the original blue team was John, Kelly and Sam. So I was like, she is one of his his oldest acquaintance. Yeah, so it would make sense. He not maybe fancied her, but really, but he we know he cares about all of blue team because there was a great moment with Linda where he hadn't seen her in a while and he finally saw her and he was like, oh my God, thank God. I will say he does a great job of something that I'd like to see in the games, which is the it's the status lights and team com. I, I would love, love to the status see that lights. of like having these lights beep and mean different things like and, and how like obviously the Spartans have their own way of communication and they have their own hand language and stuff like that of how to communicate within their armor, which is slowly being established here, which I think is amazing. But I'd love to see the lights come into play somehow like that would be, I imagine, something easily implemented in the hood of, uh, of, of the game. So I just thought that would be cool to see a status of each of each of your characters and that they wink when they're okay or when they've acquired a target and stuff like that. I liked how that's what how Linda identifies that she's taking a target out. You know what I mean? These kind of double green blimps and all that kind of stuff. It does a great job of kind of like, you can imagine John looking at those lights, waiting for a sit rep, do you know what I mean? Of like getting worried about his team. I thought that was pretty cool. I, I'd like that as well. I'd like to see more of that kind of stuff. Especially if they're going to bring blue team into Halo Infinite in some some fashion. I'd like to see more creepy armor. Creepy armor? Yeah, I'd like to see more creepy armor AI do creepy stuff. Ooh, yeah. I wanted to suggest things to you in-game. I wanted to tell you things without having a voice, you know. Just, just you'll have stuff eye. appear in the corner yeah. of the display. What was also interesting is that they had they had John contemplating whether or not he had... She, um... Oh, Rochelle, when John says, like, keep the youngest away from, like, the battlefield um, because there's a lot of dead bodies and they don't need to see that... And Rochelle kind of like softens a bit and is like, yeah, you're totally right. That's a good suggestion. You'd make a great father one day. And John's like, like, oh, oh, shit. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I don't think I want kids. I don't think I'll ever be a father. But I like it's interesting that it's it's in his head that they, they made him think about that. Yeah. Some great individual moments, I, I think. I, I, I do enjoy these character developments. Troy Denning is really good at writing good character moments, I think. Very much so. And I think this is a great great sequel to um the silent storm in terms of like it does fit very nicely and and moves very quickly yeah it's a very actiony book so if you want a big long battle book like it's just one big battle this is great yeah it's got a ton of weapons in it and stuff and you know it's got some interesting a lot of stuff. cool new things we haven't seen yet just stuff like that any final thoughts overall i'm pretty happy with this I wasn't disappointed, which was probably my biggest worry after Silent Storm, that the book wouldn't live up to it. Yeah. It doesn't do... It's no flood. No, it's no <laughs> It's no flood. It's nowhere near flood. Like we said, it's different. I think that's the way before you guys read it and you asked what I thought of it. It's like, it's different. Yeah. It's not Silent Storm. It's different. And I kind of like it, but I'm curious to see where they go with another one, hopefully. Because if they leave us on a bit of a cliffhanger like this, I'll be a little bit annoyed. No, yeah. we're definitely getting another. I think the only other thing about the books I like is they set up just how dire this first like year of the war is. Because they really drive home how on the back foot humanity are with the Covenant. Yeah. You kinda, like you get that sort of, you get it in the story of Preston Cole. And they, they say it over and over again about the outer colonies being wiped out. But... There's a line in the story where John's talking about how like, the best military engagements are that attack the best attackers attack when they're ready, but defenders defend no matter what, and that the whole when of humanity to, yeah. is now defending and they're on the back foot. And the reason they're losing is because humanity are sending the Spartans on missions that the Spartans aren't getting a hand in planning, and he's determined that going forward... Spartans will have a hand in planning their missions because that's why Silent Storm went so well is because Johnson and Crowther and John planned what they could do with what they had. 
Yeah. Whereas other people are planning missions with what they think the Spartans can do with what they have. Yes. People don't really know the capabilities of the Spartans better than actual Spartans. It's still pretty good. Like, they call him the legendary Master Chief, and you're like, it's too soon to be the legendary Master Chief. You've only really got one big success under your belt. And the, the, the synopse said it. I think that's more for the, the reader. You're reading back on this legendary hero, as opposed to, like, he is legendary in this book. I don't know. It's just the bit where I was sort of like, he's he's not legendary yet. He's still like, once he cuts his teeth on these couple of battles and then he learns to stand up for himself a bit. Yeah, he does a good job of that. And even like in the court, in the court hearing, he does way better than he did before when, de- de- when dealing with superior offer- officers and stuff like that. And that he's like, okay, I'm not going to lie, but I'm going to be careful how I tell the truth. I thought that was good. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You can see him being better at the, not just taking things at face value. That he has learned from the first book, which is good. Like, that's what you want to see. Um, there's one piece of trivia that I, in this book, already in, which was interesting. So I, I kind of dug into it just to make sure that it, it was kind of correct in what it was saying. So in this book, when it mentions that how Sam dies, it says that Sam had to use his armor self-destruct. But that isn't actually what happened in terms of what, because Sam was on the unrelenting. And if you remember, his suit was breached, so he couldn't get out the ship because they had to go into the vacuum of space. So so John ordered him to stay behind and make sure that the missiles of the bombs went off. That's kind of how he died. Like, the missile, the bombs went off on that ship to destroy it with Sam on it. That's the trivia just says that, so I'm not really not really sure. Because I did look back in the book and it does actually say, yeah, Sam had to use his self-destruct protocol. Now, maybe he did before the bombs went off or to help the bombs go off he set off the the self-destruct on his on his suit because they talk about that a lot of like setting their suit self-destructs and having it yeah. ready so that when they die they their armor self-destructs and blows up yeah like i think the first time i remember them mentioning like a self-destruct isn't until i think first strike i mm, can't remember there's a there's a spartan in first strike that goes down in like on the on the alien hierophant and they, their suit detonates and that like takes out a load of elites in a building and something. But that's the first time I think where like you specifically get that. And they yeah. definitely just Sam gets nuked. That's why he goes. Also, we, we actually now know that the real reason is that John killed Sam as another possible love interest. <laughs> and this is clearly all this time it's been a terrible secret of John's. Kelly's mine. Yes, there will only be one. <laughs> All right, is that about it, boys? That's all I got. Thank you for listening. This has been the silent, not the silent storm, the silent storm two book club. The silent storm two, more silent. More silent, more storm. Uh, this has been the B- Oblivion book club. Thank you for listening. Thank you to our patrons again. Uh, if you want to learn more about Podcast Evolved, we have a website. Just look up Halo Podcast. We have a Twitter. We have all that fun stuff. That's about all we have today. So evolve. Check out our store. Buy some merch. Oh yeah, we have merch. Please. Yeah. So I think get some evolved merch, people. Don't buy any George stuff, please. Buy all the George stuff. <laughs> buy it all. George is dead. <gasps> <laughs> I'm not talking to you anymore. <laughs> evolved. <laughs> evolved. <laughs> George lives. <laughs>